good afternoon, morning, or evening, or whatever time it is where you may be. My name is Bruce Poinsett, and welcome to your Respond to Racism meeting, monitor, and training, virtually, of course. Before we get started, I would like to get you into an icebreaker for all the participants in the room today. It's real simple. We're going to go around, introduce yourselves with your names, your preferred pronouns, and answer this question. What does white fragility mean to you and how does it show up in your everyday life? Please pause the video and take as much time as you need to complete this icebreaker with yourself and your fellow participants. Now, I think it's important to center ourselves in the mission of the work before we get into the activities involved. So with the Respond to Racism, our, our work is anti-racism. And with that, I want to center us all in RTR's mission to educate and empower Lake Oswego residents and institutions with the tools to combat racism in all its forms and make LO and Oregon a better place to live for residents of all races and ethnicities. With that in mind, let's talk about the purpose of monitoring public meetings in particular. First and foremost, this is an opportunity to advocate for anti-racist policies and best practices. It is also a tool for amplifying the voices of our BIPOC community members. And we use this particular tool for holding our elected officials, boards, and commissions accountable for doing the above. So, you may be thinking, where do I find info for the various public meetings in the city? And this is, we'll just give you a short list for the moment, and we'll have a list of other available meetings towards the end of the training. But first and foremost, you're going to want to access the City of Lake Oswego website, which you can find here. But for more targeted information, you can go to their meetings page where they have the different boards and commissions and you know starting ending date, which you can adjust accordingly, as well as links to agendas and packet materials, and as you can see, these different meetings. Then to view the meetings in another form, they also have a calendar, which again, allows you to look for the event type, which group you're looking for, and all the dates and links to them. The city also has a YouTube page where they have archives of all the videos which you can find here or look in playlist if you like specific meetings. And look here, it's our RTR steering committee member, Pat Ginn. So if you wanna watch the most recent city council meeting where some of our members testified, that's currently available right now. Now there's also the Lake Oswego School District, which you can find at their website. As you can see, we're gearing up for back to school. But within that website, they have a page for the school board, which is particularly relevant to us. So on that page, you can find all the different meetings about the school or all the different info about the school board. You can find an archive of meetings, find a description of what they do, and you can apply. <laughs> Very important. But then if you're looking for meeting schedules and agendas, you can go to that page where they have an archive of both past meetings as well as the upcoming meeting and agenda, which you can read beforehand so you're prepared. But let's look at the archive real quick. So you can find for each year, they have an archive of past meetings that includes the date, how long the actual meeting is, past agendas, meeting minutes, and video of upcoming meetings, or I should say past meetings, and we'll be watching a snippet from one of those such videos later on in this training. 
And again, make sure to access the video archive if you want to see and hear past meetings to get a better feel. So now let's talk about the aspects of the meetings. Of course, as we just talked about, the agendas are very important. So pay attention to when agendas are published. Depending on which meeting you're looking at, it can be you know, a few days before, maybe it's a day before, maybe it's a week before, but you're gonna wanna stay on top of that as well as review attachments. So let's go back, back to meeting schedules and agendas. And let's look at this upcoming school board meeting. So as you'll see, they have an attachment here under Haunan Elementary Outdoor Classroom Change Order. So you wanna click on that and you can review that. And this is how attachments are generally done. There are others in here. But again, you wanna make sure to review your attachments so that you have as much information at your disposal as possible before you go into these meetings. Other aspects include a public testimony to which you can sign up for. Again, this is based on which meeting you're looking at in terms of the instructions for signing up. But this is where you deliver a verbal testimony live for the, you know, there's a city council or the school board or whichever body you're testifying to, as well as those viewing. And it's important to note that these usually have time limits around two to three minutes for more uh, busy meetings or for meetings with a lot of testimony, sometimes that can be cut down to one or two. So again, you're gonna wanna be concise and to the point when you testify. If there's more you'd like to add or you don't necessarily feel comfortable testifying live, you can also provide written testimony, which again, helps you if you have thoughts you wanna expand upon further, or also if you wanna submit things like petitions, if you wanna you know, submit all, petitions and all the signatures, all the supplemental information, this is a good way to do that. And a quick reminder, all testimony that you submit or give is on behalf of yourself unless you have explicit permission from Respond to Racism Ella to speak on behalf of the organization. Now, let's go into a little exercise. We're gonna watch a city council clip from June, the 16th to be exact, where they're talking about the diversity task force with the city. And we're gonna watch this clip and then without giving you too much information, we want you to do a little debrief because we think it's important that you get, you know, you first try monitoring or viewing a meeting cold and then we can give you more instructions from there. our lives. Okay, we didn't get here yesterday. It's been 400 years. I hope to God it's not another 400 years down the road, but the fact is right now we are injured and this is the ICU and we give it a short period of time before we introduce more long-term strategies. And I guess, um, Bill, I do like evaluation as my fifth piece. Okay, uh, I, I have a different opinion. So when we started, as the mayor stated, we had two missions for this task force, how to get boards and commissions more diverse and how to maybe if we need it, get our staff more diverse through our policies because I'm not sure we have that many policies that are barriers, but I love the idea of looking at them and see if we had them. During this process, which as Councilor Wendell said, it was, it, it's been rough during COVID-19. We had a horrific murder that lit the city and the, lit the, uh, the country on fire, and we're in a crisis right now. And so when I hear that we can have a dialogue with our community directly, we had 60 people tonight pour their hearts out to us. And I've had 50 calls and emails in pain from people that are pouring their hearts out I think we should be there. And if I think I got John Wendland right, Council Wendland right, he's talking about a task force that would be like our budget committee. We would sit in with the DI, we would listen. It's a listening session. The questions are a good start to ask these people. We could have one focus group with boards and commission chairs, one with our interfaith community. We have 18 churches. 
others with broader community. They poured it out tonight. People are pouring their hearts out. They will do it with us there. And I also agree with the gentleman earlier that if all they get is a two minute uh, uh, time to say something, then it will be nothing more than a public hearing. So we can sit there and listen with the DI members because we are the first responders on issues. Police, fire, and paramedics are first responders on emergencies and Megan and her emergency team. But we get the issues in the street, on the phone, in the meetings all day long. And I think we should be out there. So I support what Councilor Wendland is making as a motion. And I seconded I what I'd like to explain. I, the I seconded that motion, if you don't mind. Let me let me just give my thought. Let me give my thought. I seconded that motion. This is really about relationships. The people who stepped forward tonight were bold. They were they were, they were bold. But in order to build a relationship, you have to have some basis for that. From the sounds of what people said tonight and tonight only, and not to mention other conversations that I've had, the relationship is not necessarily there with government, with the police, not having anything to do with us not having anything to do with me or Councillor Wendland or Councillor Lamont or anyone else. It's happening so far away that we, we're not a part of it. But if we don't have that relationship, we're only going to hear from the bold people, the ones that we want to hear from. The ones that we want to speak are those who wouldn't normally speak because let's face it they're they're oftentimes the most intelligent of the group i say this from experience so while i seconded that motion i completely appreciate the work of the dei committee in pulling in voices that we wouldn't normally hear from as i watched the list tonight of people who are speaking I knew 70% of those names. Think about that. 70% of all of those people I knew, either by name or by reputation. We want to hear from the people we never hear from. That is the entire point of our mission. Is it not? And I'm sorry to cut you off, Mr. De La Cruz. Excuse me for that, but I had to speak okay. my piece of my heart. I'm done. Just let me know when I can jump in. No, I'm done. I'm done. I'm talking to uh, Mayor. So, Mayor, I think you're muted. I just, oh, no, I'm not muted. Go I'm ahead. Not. I appreciate it, Mr. Cruz. Okay. So I want to explain the process because what you have to understand is the diversity and equity inclusion focus groups are is a completely different conversation than when we're talking about budget and planning and services. It's a highly emotionalized conversations where people are talking about issues around race and gender and ability and disability and access to services. And when you make that a public meeting that means the press is going to be there. There are not many people who are going to talk about a racialized experience that they had on a very personal level when the press is there. And the idea of the focus groups was always to have them small, not to have huge public meetings. It was to, they are designed, and I've done this for years and years in municipalities and schools. They're designed to get people to council person man's point who are not Part of who not who we hear from. And so we were really going to tap into the DEI task force members groups and have them invite them. And there's a level of confidentiality that has to be part of that because we're asking them to be really vulnerable and bold. And we are actually going to do some groups within the city. And people who work for you are going to be very reluctant to talk openly when you are in the room. 
Now, this is not designed to assert any of your leadership or any of your roles in terms of who you are as council people in Lake Oswego. It is designed to get feedback that's real, that's unaltered, and that they're not talking to you, but that they're talking to each other about their lived experiences here in Lake Oswego. Now, as we go through this process, there will absolutely be opportunities for all of you to be a part of these conversations. And that opportunity will be when we've had some focus groups, we have some idea of what the issues are, we have some ideas of, of, of what the groups are bringing forward that are saying, these are barriers to me being uh, a black, gay, Muslim person, or whatever their identity is. Everybody has identity. So, so the way people identify and the way that they show up um, has to be in some way, not protected, but um, maintain a level of safety that they can speak their truth. And so, so we have members who have access to people in the gay community, in the Muslim community, in the religious community, in neighborhood groups, in uh, a variety of groups that I don't believe were all represented this evening. And so, so that's really the, the way that the focus group process works. And, and absolutely, you all need to be part of these conversations. I would just say it wouldn't be the initial steps. And, and, and to your point, um, John Wendland, around the process, it's important that, that we have a process that allows for that type of open conversation and also allows you opportunities to be able to then engage your community just like you want to. So that is not off the table. And so I don't want you to get the wrong impression on that. It's just that we would create a plan where we would have some of these more intimate focus groups where people could just talk openly and then uh, figure out the timing for a larger public meeting when it's not as much about people sharing their raw emotions and stories, it's more about Here's where we want to go. Because I have to be really honest, I've facilitated some pretty challenging focus groups where there was a lot of emotion, a lot of anger, and I have strategies and ways to support people in moving through that to then get to these are the real issues that we need to talk about. And so, and, and my last point I'll make is um, I don't control the DEI committee, I facilitate and I make sure that we were staying in the lanes that you created for us to begin with, and, and I'll do that if you approve this 4.3 as well. And part of what we would get back to you is a process of where, where it would be um, appropriate for you all to be involved in these conversations and even in, to support you in smaller community meetings where you could really have a dialogue with the diversity of folks. So, so that's the way the process works. It's going to be really targeted. I swap out the word control for corral. All yeah. right. Councilor Wendland, go ahead. Yep. Oh, John, hit it. Hit your button. John, unmute yourself. John, unmute yourself. There, there, we, there we go. There you go. So, uh, I get that. I'm okay with that, but the I would say that the recommendations by the end of 2020, I go and do some focus groups, but I think you're going to report back what you found. I don't necessarily want recommendations at this point. And in fact, that's what I think my disconnect with this is that if you have people that are unelected and they're going out at the DEI task force and starting to make recommendations. And as a community leader, if I haven't been part of that process, it's hard for me to make a decision. But if so that, you come back, That's fair. Back, that's fair. Yeah, that's okay. absolutely fair. And, and what, what, I mean, if what you're looking for is frequent and periodic check-ins to make sure the task force is not bringing you recommendations that are um, outside of the realm of either possible or acceptable, then I think we can totally bring you bi-monthly updates. And well, I'm, not, I'm talking about not necessarily recommendations. I'm talking about more information to feed us. Um, You'll then, want that. Then, you as a bigger, then as a bigger group, we can start structuring how we can go about making decisions and making recommendations for more community input and so on. Does that some make of sense? The, some of the recommendations, though, are going to be ones. I don't, I don't, I don't want to make 
um, light of what I'm about to say, where you're going to look at me and you're going to say, why haven't we done that already? Right. And so I don't, I want you to spend your time as a council on the big leadership and policy issues, setting the table, things around like the community engagement piece. How are we going to lead the police department? That's all in your bailiwick. But when we get recommendations that we should translate materials into the top five languages spoken in Lake Oswego, really, I should just go do that. Right. So wow. that's where I think I wouldn't, I, I hear what you're saying in terms of you want to make sure you're leading. I think that we are all agree with that. And, and periodically, but I also think in the bigger picture, there's an important aspect to this to have, uh, I mean, I, you know, it's June now and what can we accomplish as a council to be providing some feedback engagement with the community on, you know, IE, I think there's a lot of questions that we wanted to ask Dale Jorgensen about the police that really probably have nothing to do with DEI. It has everything to do with how we're operating the police. And I don't want to have that exclusive of the, we need to be doing that as well. Understood. Can I, uh, can I, I know, I, I interrupt Councillor Lamont. Councillor Wayne. Hey, I Councillor Wayne, Councillor Wayne. Okay. All right, so look through this, and I'm thinking, we got to do this, okay? Who are we kidding here? I mean, quite frankly, when we I sat in on these DEI interviews, right, and it was pounded into the table, you will not veer beyond these two tasks. We want to keep our pulse on you as advisory board. You're going to work for six months. You're going to do two things and two things only, and will you commit to that? We've already, at this at this point, what are we trying to do here? We're trying to put, we're saying, hey, you're an advisory board. You're going to give us count. You're going to give advice to council. Yet you want to control it, keep it in a box. We look at this like parks. And parks is, a, is also an unelected body. But we trust them to be able to give us guidance on how we spend our parks bond. Even the library, you know, those are all resources that we have. The more we try to control this and say, hey, we need to make this a, a public meeting, uh, and, and public and make it, um, it just, I mean, I'm, I'm just going to repeat what, what um, you know, uh, uh, Bill Delcruz just said. The whole idea, the reason why we don't have more people even testifying, if you think 60 people is a lot, try having this meeting at six o'clock in the afternoon. We'd be here until midnight. Yep, I agree. But I think at the, the, at the point here right now is that, you know, say that really we are talking about little things to, and, and for, for the public to look in and also as a person of color, all we're doing is basically using process as a way to limit how we how we have this conversation, and that's what I think that you know we're we're too afraid to say hey and like and I I, I, I applaud you, um, city manager, languages, that and see even to the, to the point that we are I, talking about this thing here, if we were call in our in our initial goal setting at the beginning of 2019, this was not a priority in the first cut. It was not a priority in the cut, and thanks to Councillor um, Koloff and Councillor Mance for really pushing this, but I know that in the previous years, we've never gotten this far. And the only reason why we got this far was we were willing to put on, put it in a small box, six months, six months only, and two topics. And so if, we're, if you're serious about it now, then let's do something about it. If not, then just, just scrap the whole idea, because I think if at this point, if we're trying to look at this and say, hey, you know, the community wants more. They want to have more, uh, more involvement. They want to see more of what's going on here. They want to see council be able to actually talk about this in a sincere way. But all we're doing right now by saying, "Hey, you know, we want to make all these meetings public, and we're going to, um, you know, we're going to push it out farther and farther," to the person that's in the community, you think about this. I mean, if we look back on all the applicants that we got, there were people that applied, were given an interview date, and then declined. There were people that are applied and accepted and chosen and they were declined. They basically said, you know, on second thought, no, I don't think this is a legit effort. Or you look at that, if you can ask Megan, how many people were actually interviewed, had gone through the process, except, you know, and we had selected them and they said, no, actually on second thought, no, I'm not going to do this. So I think only, I think at this point, although we see, we, we may think that 60 people is a lot, three o'clock in the afternoon on a Tuesday, you know, it's not going to cut. You even saw some public comments here. 
three o'clock is in the middle of the workday. People may not be going to work, but they're on the, they're on the computer. They've got other Zoomies they've got to go to. And we've seen people drop off right now. There's seven people still on here. Who has the time to be able to, uh, to sit in, in, in front of a computer like this? Folks, we got so I think this point, what I'm trying to yeah, I, I will harken back. What I'm saying is that- Real quick, I'll harken back to the fact that the people who are speaking up to Mr. De La Cruz's point, um, to others' point, were the vocal people who would speak up. If our charge is to bring in people from the outside, okay. we have to step okay. aside. Matt, wait a minute, guys. You're covering points that everybody's already made, I think. Welcome back. So after we've watched this now, let's go through a few discussion questions. First, what were your initial observations? Does it, did this exchange raise any concerns for you? What further questions do you have? And is there anything you feel like you needed to know before watching this? And before you answer those, I'd like to add that as you can see, that entire meeting was about a little under five hours and that particular discussion in full was maybe an hour and a half so i would encourage you to on your own time view the entire meeting or at least view the entire discussion for more context and more information but as you can see it's very involved now with your partners in the discussion today I want you to take about 10 minutes, pause the video, and go through these questions, and we'll be back. Now that you've gone through a cold exercise of monitoring a clip from a meeting, let's go into what it looks like to do this work with an equity lens. The following is a definition from grantcraft.org, which I found to be particularly helpful. So according to grantcraft, Using an equity lens means paying disciplined attention to race and ethnicity while analyzing problems, looking for solutions, and defining success. So some questions that you might ask while watching a meeting include, whose voice is being heard? Whose is not? Can you identify any biases that seem to be at play? Was there discussion of the implications for different culturally specific groups in terms of decision making or policy or anything else that is being discussed. Where is money being spent and who is benefiting? This is going to be a crucial one. Also, identify opportunities for previously identified equity initiatives. For example, both in Respond to Racism as well as uh, related community conversations, We've talked about the need for developing a community cultural center. So look for opportunities in the meeting where maybe there's a place to put funding towards that or spaces within the community to develop such a thing. We've also talked about art projects that are specifically representative and done by BIPOC um, artists. So again, looking for opportunities in meeting initiatives or uh, council, school board, et cetera, initiatives for such projects or activities. And then lastly, we want you to pay attention to patterns in behavior and rhetoric. Are there certain, are there certain talking points that you notice being used repeatedly to dismiss issues that affect people of color in the community or to divert attention? Are people being, do you notice a way that certain issues are being ignored or discussed? As you watch meetings over time, mark these things down. It may not come to you initially. It may not be obvious initially, but as you watch, you start noticing things. You start noticing, again, patterns and behavior and rhetoric. 
And once you start picking up on these things, that can help uh, help you as you adjust your approach. Now let's talk about documenting observations, which is another very crucial part of this work. Ongoing documentation helps us identify patterns as we previously discussed, and it helps us build an information infrastructure, both for respond to racism as well as others who wish to document the anti-racism fight in LO. For example, a recent graduate of Lake Ridge, Maya Gordon, used many clips from our meetings as well as our RTR storytelling project for a documentary titled Lake No Negro, which we hope will be used both by the city and school district in further anti-racism orientation and education programming. So how will we do this? For starters, we're gonna have at least one meeting monitor always be assigned to take notes at these meetings. We want you to do this in groups. We want one person from that group to always be assigned to take notes so we have a level of consistency and accountability. You'll record these notes in a Google Doc for which we will provide you a template and then Respond will organize and maintain an archive of these meeting notes, again, for future use, whether it's for dealing with some of these policies in real time, maybe it's creating letters to the editor, maybe it's for further study, but it could also be for others down the line who maybe want to further document and need more information or more details about how things play out. Or maybe even if it gets to the point where someone needs to bring, say, a lawsuit or other legal action against a body in the city, we will have this meeting note information available to them so they can have as much information as possible in taking action because too often there's a lot of holes and things are left up to the discretion of frankly bad actors. So again, documentation is very important and we want to make sure we have as much as possible as well as a group around us so that we have consistency and accuracy in how we're doing this documentation. Speaking of which, we are going to utilize group chats for both monitoring and documenting meetings. So why do we do this? First of all, it's a way of keeping people engaged because as you saw with a potentially five hour meeting, it's a lot of time and a lot of process and legalese at times, and it can be easy to check out. So by doing this as a group, it allows you to one, converse in real time with each other, ask questions and learn from each other's observations. Ideally, we'd hope to have an intergenerational group of people, so it could be students, it could be people with more you know, past or present government experience. And we want you to learn from each other, learn from different eyes and just different uh, perspectives and grow your knowledge and grow your ability to react and respond to what's happening. While in the future, we may use a uh, platform such as Slack, right now, we're encouraging monitors to take an informal group chat approach. So maybe this is getting a text chain to, together with each other. Maybe this is using Facebook chat or Google Messenger or even Twitter, Instagram, or anything else. But it is key, it's very crucial for you to do this as a group and do this in a team capacity. Again, so we have accountability and accuracy and just a way to keep yourself engaged. You'll find as you do this that there's a bit of a reality TV aspect to this. Unfortunately, that reality is also the decisions being made about your life. So take, make no mistake, it's very serious. Now, let's do a, another exercise. This time, we're gonna watch a clip from a recent school board meeting, and we'll follow this up with some more targeted questions for 
looking at this with an equity lens. I want to transition to uh, current events uh, beyond COVID that are in our community, in our school district, and that are so important and critical um, in our work together. And that is uh, uh, race relations, the Black Lives Matter movement. And I want to applaud the incredible work of our students. Uh, I attended the open session on racism last Friday, and that was the second of those. And um, and before that, you know, we had our, our students came together on June 5th for a peaceful protest. And we, I've heard from a lot of our students via email um, about their passion for wanting to be part of a solution in terms of supporting our district to be uh, vigilant and active in the anti-racism work and wanting to be a part of um, supporting our curriculum to ensure that all the way from elementary school through high school, we are providing our students with opportunities to understand themselves and each other and the world around them better and to be more explicit about that in our curriculum. And I, again, applaud the leadership work of our students. And I'll just briefly acknowledge that some of the um, testimony that was provided, uh, or the testimony that was provided for this evening that Chair Wagner mentioned that was submitted um, by Miranda Doyle and was signed by many of our staff and community members and students um, was a petition that is requesting, again, our, our um, district to be more active in its work around um, anti-racism and understanding biases, biases and supporting our students in their social emotional uh, mental health um, learning and development. And I, I won't be doing this tonight, but it is certainly a worthy um, document that I would love for us to go through bit by bit. I'm going to be working through it with our diversity equity and inclusion committee, which of course is a major part of their work is to advise the board. Um, I do want to just note that many of the requests in the petition, I'm so glad to say, are, are actions that are already underway in our school district. They're not completed. We're not nearly far enough down the road um, as where we need to be. But I'm so glad to say that we do, in fact, uh, track, for instance, one of the re requests was to track and report racist incidents in our schools. And, and we do track and record those incidents. Every principal does. That was something that I was able to share with the DEI committee this year. And I believe I shared it at a board meeting as well. There is also um, a request to conduct a thorough audit of our existing curriculum. And that work was begun, I believe, last year or the year before by having Extanto evaluate all of our textbooks. Um, I believe that was last year. And um, and that is work that needs to continue, of course. And I know that a committee has been put together to examine our curriculum, our literature, and our future adoptions. And that some of that work was meant to expand this spring but of course with COVID that work has been postponed a bit but Dr. Sheely is definitely organizing that work with uh, staff members. Additionally uh, there was a request within the petition to uh, um, update and approve our reading lists and to remove data and stereotypical titles and a, a few teachers had already reached out to me about that and I'm, I'm so glad to say that the um, the staff has a plan for that to be underway again that was going to start this spring but has been postponed a bit and will resume there was also a request to train our staff in restorative justice practices and i'm glad to remind folks that we did bring in an outside the district consultant um, diana katai who's the founder of coaching peace whose clients range from school districts to national organizations. And one of her specialties is restorative practices and restorative justice. And she trained all of our administrators on those practices. And we are definitely excited now to take that training to all of our staff. So we're going to be working with our association to consider when um, is the best time and um, 
time and place, essentially. So we're thinking, is it PD November? Is it going to happen at staff meetings? We want to partner with our association and our um, administrators and our staff to determine when the best time is for that training. Because I agree that it is beneficial for all of us to have a common understanding about restorative practices. And there is also a request to commit to a multi-year professional development plan around diversity, equity, inclusion, and anti-racism. And we certainly want to implement that. We had begun that work again this year, but it was stalled due to COVID. Um, and we also want to make sure that we are um, including our association and our staff and our and of course central office and the board in determining the best ways to implement that. But I couldn't agree more. Um, and then of course we are, there is a request in the petition to examine our district re recruitment and hiring policies and practices. And yes, absolutely. This goal was set last year. We put a sharp focus on it for this hiring season. Um, I, I, I would venture to say that um, the folks who are hiring in our system are very uh, well aware of my high valuing of um, bringing diverse candidates to the table as well as to the interview as well as to utilize questions that bring out equity mindedness in those that we are um, interviewing because that is the culture that we're building in our in our school district and um, those are the only I'm going to speak of right now because I want to, those were pieces that we have already in, begun to engage in. We certainly do have a lot more work to do. And then I want to have an opportunity to engage with our DEI committee with some of uh, the requests that we haven't yet been able to enact because they're an incredible organized collaborative advisory board and a great place um, to work through some of these plans. So I just wanted to make sure that I acknowledged that I agree with most, if not all, of what was submitted on that petition. And um, we have worked both underway and postponed, but picking up again post-COVID. Um, and by post-COVID, I mean after the school shutdowns and now that we are moving toward uh, summer and fall. And then we have work that we haven't started yet that we need to um, make sure that we do because uh, as we're building a culture of belonging in our school district, we've made some great strides this school year, but we have a long ways to go. Thank you, Dr. Dan Cruz. Questions from board members? Um, yeah, I'll ask a question. Um, so is this, are we, so I also, you know, I obviously received the petition, I've read through it and you addressed nearly every, nearly every request in this and many of them are, as you mentioned, uh, referred to in our uh, resolution, our anti-racism resolution later. Um, I just, I'm just wondering, um, the first one that's mentioned refers to the school resource officers and that's the one that I've heard most commonly um, from students. Um, so I just want to acknowledge that one and acknowledge that that I think that is you know it's something that we need to we need to address and and talk about openly. I mean, I we we just had a, a um, our local option levy. One of the reasons, one of the things we asked for on that was an additional school resource officer. So I I, I just think it's important to acknowledge what's being said here. Um, uh, the role of school resource officers is different in different districts and across the nation, and it's tied into a lot of the um, uh, concerns about policing. Um, so I just want to, I just want to acknowledge it here as something that I, I, I understand you're going to take the whole thing back to the, the DEI committee, but I just, since you talked about everything else, I, I just really wanted to call that one out as well. Oh, yeah. And I think there were a couple of other items that um, I didn't mention. However, I'm glad you brought that up, um, Director Wallen, because I, I do feel that that is a really important topic. and. You know, we certainly, if we were going to be considering any changes, we would need a community conversation to determine the best decision um, for all. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, yes, our SR, the SRO that our school district um, funds is one SRO out of the two in our partnership with LOPD. And, um, and so of course that is the equivalent of one 
um, full-time FTE, full-time equivalent. And I know that there was a request within the petition to hire additional counselors and social workers. And something that um, I am, I am glad about is that in our partnership with Lake Oswego Police Department and my um, ongoing conversations with Chief Jorgensen, something that I not only see in practice but continue to learn about is that our SROs, of course, are much more than a presence of law enforcement in our schools. They are in our schools building community, building relationships. Yes, they are also here in our schools as an additional layer of safety, um, but they are also providing support for families and students. They're providing support um, with event management. And, you know, I've learned in my conversations with Chief Jorgensen over the year that our SROs have participated in um, a multitude of trainings, uh, 40 hours and beyond of training in crisis prevention intervention, as well as um, crisis prevention through mental health support. And those are taught by mental health professionals. And, and that is some of the, the uh, support that is provided in our schools too. And then additionally, in our my conversations with Chief Jorgensen, we're just talking about, you know, other ways that our Um, SROs can or would be supportive and how that support and service might change or adapt to, um, for accessibility and approachability. And having said all that, I want to acknowledge that I, I understand and empathize with the fact that not every student is coming into our schools with the same perception of SROs and that is important to note. And um, I, of course, want to, um, I honor that and I want to understand it more. And I want for you know whoever is in our schools to be there and perceived by all of our students as, as support. And so I wanna partner with our students as well. I, I've had some great conversations with some of our students already. And um, I certainly understand the perspective that's in the broader community. But, and I think the bottom line is that if we were going to make any you know uh, definitive change that it would be a community conversation to determine um, what's best for our community as a whole. Thanks for bringing that up. I didn't actually have notes to speak about that, but I was sliding through my notes. So. It, it, it's just that I, it was the first, it's the first one, it's the one I've heard the most about, and I think that there, you know, a conversation needs to happen either way. Absolutely. Additional questions? Here's the Welcome back. So now, based on the clip you just saw, we have some more discussion questions. First, in listening to the responses from the board, how do you feel about the anti-racism resolution? And how do you feel about the board's or a certain board member's response to the petition? Based on this clip, are there obstacles you foresee in engaging with the school board? What about opportunities? And lastly, can you brainstorm some strategies for making sure the communities that represent LO's BIPOC population have meaningful input in LOSD school board decisions? Again, take, let's go for 15 minutes this time. Take about 15 minutes to go through all these questions with yourself and your partners, and then we will wrap up for a debrief of today's session. Welcome back. So now, let's debrief. First, if you have questions, please, or further questions about any of the clips we saw today, about the work in general, please submit them to respondtoracism.org slash contact and use the subject line re-meeting monitoring. As far as next steps, we are gonna be sending everyone who has gone through this initial training and final individual monitoring exercise. So it's gonna be another clip. We're gonna give you the sheet in which to record your notes. And from there, we will you know, get you plugged into monitoring actual, actual meetings. So you can sign up to monitor and we'll give you a list of which meetings we're gonna focus on shortly. And we also wanna make sure you recruit others because there, there's a lot going on in the city and we need as much people power as possible to get this work done. 
How much, you ask? Here's a short list, an incomplete list of meetings that need monitors. Again, because of our capacity at this moment, we'll be focusing on the first three, which are the City Council and Redevelopment Agency, the LOSD School Board, and the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Task Force for the City of Lake Oswego. An important note on the DEI Task Force is that these meetings do not include a public comment. So while you are allowed to watch these meetings, it, these will not be ones where you can submit testimony or directly interact. However, it is still important to watch and monitor what's happening, take notes, discuss amongst yourselves, and if further action is needed, to organize that. And we also have a plethora of other areas which we hope to include volunteers or gain volunteers to monitor going forward. This includes the Planning Commission, the Development Review Commission, the Parks Board, the Sustainability Advisory Board, the 50 Plus Advisory Board, the Transportation Advisory Board, the Historic Resources Advisory Board, the Library Advisory Board, the Budget Committee, and the Watershed Council. Again, these different boards and commissions and councils have different rules in terms of public engagement, how, uh, or yeah, how you can submit uh, testimony, but you know, look at their parameters to figure that out and organize. And again, as we gain more volunteers, we'll begin to start deploying them to these other areas so that we can you know, have eyes and ears everywhere because anti-racism needs to be done at all levels of the city's operations. And the more people power we can get on this work, the better. Thank you again for taking the time to go through this training. It's a little, it can be a little bit dense, but it's very important work. And we need people as engaged and again, having eyes and ears as far and wide as we possibly can get them. So happy meeting monitoring and we look forward to working with you. Thank you.